In Memory of Dick Robinson and sponsored by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Hey, Jerry, I'm so excited to be here at the National Book Festival with you. What an honor. Well, thank you. And my pleasure as well, Meg. I started reading some of the year your books and um, I'm just thrilled and anxious to get started in a conversation. And again, welcome everyone to the National Book Festival. This is probably maybe my third or fourth time each time presented itself with um, with wonder and discovery. So thank you for the invite. Yeah, it's one of my favorite festivals too. Mm -hmm. I, I love it. I love it when it's in person, <laughs> when we all gather um, in the Capitol, but I'm, I'm very, very glad for this opportunity too. And to be able to dig into to both our books. You know, my, my family had arrived um, as immigrants and so there just wasn't a lot of money to have the way, for example, my own children, we had books all over the place, but that just wasn't how it was in my apartment. And and also there was a language barrier, right? So my mother just didn't know the um, the canon, I guess, of, of children's literature and so on. So I came to it a lot. I think my storyteller's year as a writer um, has come to me through the stories that my aunts and my grandmother and my mother used to tell about their lives in Cuba, like full of drama and completely inappropriate for children who are five, but still, you know, like this notion of a journey and a person and suffering and coming out on the other side, like all of those kinds of stories sort of told, drew me in. So I, it's funny, you know, you can get drawn in through your ears, you could get drawn in through art, you know, there's, there's so many ways to become a reader besides exactly. just, just the words on a page. Yeah. I want to, I want to share a story with you because you, you prompted me in, in a way that uh, brought something to mind. It was that um, it was my mother was the reader in my home. And she, uh, I loved the fact she had a sort of a reading chair. Um, and next to her chair, there was, um, a, you know, a table where she would keep on it. There were two books. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson and the Bible. Um, and what I remember as a kid growing up struggling with reading was to see the smiles, the smile on her face as she read. And I think I'm, I've become a reader today trying to capture that sense of, of joy that my mother uh, showed as she read. But um, but that's interesting. You're right. I mean, there's so many ways to come to that point where literature and reading and seeing becomes important or enriches your life and takes you somewhere. I think in terms of, of my work, it's 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 a, a sharing. Um, I've always thought of my work as a way of speaking to uh, the viewer. So um, my books, if you look at my body of work, they all talk about going someplace or discovering something. Um, the idea for me is to pretend I'm the reader or the viewer. And where do I want to go? What do, what do I want to uh, explore? And so that my work, and you look at it in, in terms of, I'm going to go back to the fact that um, as a person who has a challenge reading, where I found my way through poetry and through poetry to prose. And so when you see my work and my body of work that I've illustrated, it is that. It's fiction. It's nonfiction. Um, it's, it's poetry. It's, it's, it's all those things. So my effort to open myself up to the world is what I try to do in my work. And and Meg, what do you what do you how do you think? I think I'm going to piggyback on that because for me, I what I'm trying to do is 
um, sort of create a really authentic and honest window into Latinx families, right? Um, there are so many stereotypes that have seeped into um, how we view Latinos in, in the US. And so I, I like to draw the women and the men and the children that I knew growing up. I like to draw the family connections. I like to draw um, the way we speak. I like to draw translanguaging where we're switching back and forth in languages. I like to draw the humor and the warmth and the love. Um, I like to draw the challenges of it, the economic challenges sometimes, the status challenges of it, um, the, su the real suffering that, yeah. that happens in communities as well. I just, I feel like an urgency around helping children be seen and valued I feel an urgency around normalizing um, and not othering children um, for who they are and their circumstances. So I, I mean, I, that's really, I think, what I most want. And, and I, I want that for kids who go to school, maybe with not a lot of Latinx kids um, as classmates. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, they meet people like me and others through a book. You know, for a long time through a book before they're actually in college and in other places where they're going to interact more widely with a wider range of people. But I'm, I really, it's, it's the story of being really specific to, to Latinx people and, and in that specificity becoming universal. What is it that we're all longing for and loving and, and searching for as we grow up? Oh, that sounds so complicated, oh, but somehow when I sit it's down, smooth. it's okay. It's I love that you want it to be immediate and and, um, and you want to draw people in. And I think it also speaks to being proud of who you are, you know, and where you've come from. And I think when you, sometimes when you come from a, um, a, a culture or a, a people that have been uh, we've been denied or told that you're less than, then then there is that urgency and immediacy that you want to. So I'm going to ask you this question too, because I feel it too. There is a sort of a, um, a there's the artistry, all right? There's the ideas, the storytelling, but there is also a necessity to tell that story, um, a need to tell the story. And the need comes from, from, the story I need, what I want to say about myself, how I want my children or my grandchildren and my great grandchildren to respond, and how others, how the children respond. I mean, you want to, you want to tell your story. I want to tell my story, but with the hope that it also uh, builds and enriches the lives of others, and and uh, that certainly people who and children who look like me. But also, as Meg said, those children that don't look like me, that's also important. So uh, it's amazing because you always I always think that, OK, it is about sitting down at my drawing table and, and, and producing drawings. But it's also about all that other stuff that's churning in your head that becomes a must to tell. Well, right. I mean, how would we separate it from ourselves? I mean, yeah. you do, you know what I'm saying? These are the only eyeballs I have. Right. <laughs> and the only hands and the only experience that I have. So I'm yeah. going to bring it as honestly as I can. And, you know, when I think of your work, especially your new book, The, the, little, the Retelling of the Little Mermaid, which I had the pleasure of, of reading this week, mm -hmm. you know, the, the illustrations are, uh, as always, so lush and layered and just, it was a perfect blend, I think, of what we're talking about, the familiar with a new, uh, with a retelling and this notion of hanging on to your voice. Yeah. And the, ne the necessity of voice in this really familiar tale. I loved that. And, I, you know, as you know, in my own work, I write a lot and I focus a lot on voice and girls' voices and yes. Latinx voices. So like that notion of not trading that in. 
Yeah. I, you know, I don't think you've traded it in as a, as an illustrator and author. I haven't traded it in and no one should, no one should, right. Our, our authentic stories, our authentic selves, I think are, it's, it's needed so that kids can, can find themselves, their, their own authentic story and the, the things that they want to say about themselves too. My most recent book is Merci Suarez Can't Dance, which looks like this. And it's a follow-up to Merci Suarez uh, Changes Gears, which uh, won the Newbery, which was very scary to, to write a follow-up to a book that kids really love. Um, the last thing you want to do is mess up the characters that they love, right? You want to give them a really worthy next story. But what's interesting is that Merci started for me at, in a short story. Um, in a, an anthology called Flying Lessons and Other Stories. I, the story is called Soul Painting Ink, Soul Like the Sun, right? And so in it, Mercy uh, was a girl uh, on a day, and she was going to spend the day with her father on a paint job. Her father owns a paint company. And um, they were going to paint the gymnasium at her new fancy school in exchange for a tuition, um, you know, rebate or discount. And so... It ends up being a story about economic class. It ends up being a story about feeling unseen in a space where you're, you're supposed to be long, but there are some things that make you invisible in that space. Um, and, you know, like all short stories, right? It's just a little piece that's supposed to, you know, shine, you know, make you think of the larger piece. But when I finished that story, I couldn't stop. And so I wrote, I kept writing her and she became Mercy Suarez in Mercy Suarez Changes Gears. And she's different in the novel. Um, in the story, her parents are divorced. In the novel, she was her parents are together and she lives in this sort of extended family. And what's interesting to me is that I, I've gone back to look at original drafts of what it looked like, what Mercy was like in the story, and then what she was like in early drafts of the novel. And I found one from 2016. Um, which is a couple of years before the novel came out. And in it, you know, Mercy has failed sixth grade. And um, and she does, you see some of the characters that will live. Duerto, the one-eyed cat, is there. Broly, her brother, is there. Um, but he's not in college. He's younger. And her parents are, are not sending her to this opportunity. They're making her change schools because she's failed sixth grade and they want more rigor, et cetera. So, What's interesting, I think, is that you start out with one idea, but it's only the beginning. And I think that like when we write things, we have to give ourselves room to sort of experiment and see where this character is taking us and then make other decisions as we go along. But I, I think, you know, one of the most exciting things for me about writing and the most tiring <laughs> and the most daunting is that it's mostly rewriting. It's mostly revisioning. It's mostly seeing what you put down and saying, hmm, I need to, what happens if I change this? What happens if that happens? What happens if I change this character or drop them or whatever? And it's, it's kind of exciting. That's what makes it exciting for me to see what develops that's buried somewhere in the back of my imagination that I have no, you know, I have no idea about when I first sit down. How about you, Jerry? How did how does that work for you in terms of il illustration and and telling a story through through picture and art? Well, it's interesting because in in um, in the past, what has happened is that um, uh, a writer writes a story, and then a publisher decides to publish that story and looks at the possibilities for that perfect match of that marriage of illustration and text. So I get the, um, I get the text um, from the publisher and then I, and then I uh, make my decisions from there. Now the text is the jumping off point. That's my springboard. However, in the case of the little mermaid, it sort of went a different way. And that is that I had always in the past love the idea of painting water. I've always had an interest in um, the undersea. 
uh, I think it's just absolutely magical of, 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 of talking about discovery and exploring. Uh, what better place to explore than that world uh, of the ocean, on the ocean floor? Because there's so much we don't know. So I started with, interesting enough, not with a text. That came later. It started with um, taking Hans Christian Andersen and said, what aspects of it, what beats, um, what story, visual storylines that are a must for me? And I did that by starting with a number, and I'll hold these up. Uh, these are small, so what do you call uh, drawings? Uh, they're not thumbnail sketches because thumbnail sketches are much smaller. These are much larger. And so I did easily with only in mind what 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 parts of that story do I value and would make very interesting visual storytelling. And then I said, I won't worry about the text. I'll come back to that. So I did, I just did one after another, one after another, until I get, I've got, I've told the story through pictures. And with those images in mind, I went back I went back to begin to write the text. So the process was uh, starting as a visual storyteller first, then um, thinking about how I could knit those um, images together. And then I started the text. Um, and, and I'll give you, the, and, and these drawings would go even further. Let me share this with you. This is for the cover, but you can see, um, You can see how an idea generates and becomes bigger. And it was also, we talk about, Meg, you talk about often about joy. And it was also the joy of making marks and having those marks have some sort of meaning. Um, and then it went from there to um, deciding which, which of those drawings I wanted to now complete the idea with, with text, with prose that I would start to write. So it went back and forth, writing back and forth, drawing, writing back and forth. And the other thing that I wanted to do, I've been doing this for over 60 years. I wanted to bring some sort of more excitement to my process because I wanted to be always the energy for me is to feel as if I'm approaching it for the first time. So, um, so, so you can see this effort. So, so there's a lot that goes into um, of, of how an artist, how a writer uh, thinks about the process and then the hope that we get something that um, is valuable at the end. One incredible thing of, about your process is the decision-making, right? And, and I think like, we begin with with this garden of ideas, of, of choices that we could make. There are so many ways you could have told The Little Mermaid, right? Different illustrations, different ways in. I think that's the exciting part about writing and illustrating also. There is no one way, yes. right? There's all kinds of ways and that's the exciting part. And maybe what, what keeps you, you know, 60 years in, right? Finding the exciting new paths in. And the other thing that I, really appreciated about um, your book that felt so much like a, a yearning that I have from my own is you you moved away from the romance as the goal yes for Melanie and that is a, a choice and that is a really powerful choice to put in a book that will be read by um, girls and boys Right. Yeah. I feel like that's important, that especially for young girls, like the, the notion of getting the handsome prince or whoever right, is, uh, is, is not the thing. She's yeah. after connection with other people. She's after finding her own voice. And those feel like really important things in my body of work also. And so I so appreciate it every time I see it in in other people's work. I'm just I feel like a warm blanket is on my shoulders. So thank <laughs> you for that who I was as a writer, I guess, as a little kid. So I was very talkative. I know you can't imagine, but I was very talkative. <laughs> and I was uh, hard to keep still. 
in the classroom. I was excited by a lot of stuff. You know, I was that kind of person. And, um, and I think I was a good writer. I see, I remember very clearly, Mrs. Zuckerman, my first poem was, you know, it was the seventies. So you'll remember this, Jerry, right? When everything was give a hoot, don't pollute. Remember that, that whole campaign. And, yeah. you know, they were all, at, you know, Smokey the Bear. Okay. So we were very much about saving the earth. Right. And look where we are now. But okay. Um, and my poem was uh, pollution is nasty. Garbage is too. Why isn't the sky clear, clear blue? The birds have left. They have not said goodbye. It, and so on. It was a very simple poem. But she wrote on it that Margaret, which is what people called me then, Margaret, you are a good writer. And I was not a child that people said that about often, you know, that you are good at X. I was good enough at things, but I was not a shining anything, right? But that felt like a big shiny badge. And, you know, as, as I said, I, I grew up listening to stories and a sense of drama and a sense of people on journeys. And so over the course of being a kid, I wrote stories. I liked when my teacher assigned us an essay. I was not worried about written reports. I um, did write for the paper in um, in high school. So I was always drawn to those kinds of things. Interestingly, when I became an adult, I was really afraid to step out as a writer. And I was afraid because, you know, my mom had very practical concerns for me. She wanted me to have a job where I could feed myself, mm. where I would have health benefits, where, you know, boring sort of adult things, but that you need to survive, right? That it's not a joke. And there was no one with money in our family who was going to help provide a, a safety net for us, right? So she was not crazy about daughters who wanted to go into the arts. So I was 40 years old before I started writing in earnest for children. And it was because I tried to write lots of stuff. I tried to do lots of other careers. I was a teacher. I loved teaching. I, I wrote, you know, marketing materials. I was a development person. All these other jobs that I, I could do and I could make money and I had health insurance, but I wasn't happy. It was the space inside of me that wasn't getting filled. And so the one thing I say to kids is this. Um, I think if you have like a desire, a passion, you'll know because it makes you feel so good when you're doing it, whether you're, it's drawing or whether it's writing or reading, um, you owe it to yourself to try. And I waited a long time, but then I finally did try. And once I did, I knew I had put on the right pair of shoes, so to speak. It felt right. Um, you know, my first book came out. It was met, uh, it was called Milagro's Girl from Away, no longer in print, but it was the beginning. And then things just kept building from there. I wish I had had more courage earlier. Um, and so when I see kids, and I especially Latino kids or or kids who don't maybe haven't seen lots of examples of people uh, like them who have written books or illustrated books, I say to them try. If it's something you really love, try. That's beautifully said. Yeah. I, um, when I was a kid growing up, there were no artists in my neighborhood or, um, or in my family at all. So I didn't quite understand. I wasn't able to grasp that there was a possibility that I would become an artist and an artist, but also make a living. I mean, that wasn't even there at all. It was more about what Meg had talked about um, and a sense of passion. I, I needed to, to make pictures. I needed it to keep myself balanced. Um, I was a kid that was had a hard time in school. So, uh, but I could do one thing. I could do one thing that, that seemed to be um, um, uh, my, seemed to be Jerry. And um, it also, people looked at me, they looked at Jerry because he could draw. Uh, so I continued to draw and I found that first uh, it satisfied um, 
uh, a sort of a space, a landscape for me, a place where I could go and be by myself. We grew up in a small house in uh, Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania. There was um, eight of us, mom and dad and, and, um, and six children. And we all lived in this little teeny house. Um, and so and I, needed, I needed my own space. My own personal space actually ended up being the size of a sketch pad because there I could sit and be by myself. Um, all the energy, um, and it was, it, was, it was wonderfully chaotic, and if you can say that, because it was energy, it was people who loved life. But, um, but I, was, I was, so I needed my own space. I always shared a room. I didn't have to share my sketch pad space. That space, and I would, and it became my, it became for me a sense of uh, safety net, my own sort of um, place, uh, my own personal space, uh, and I continue to do it, and I continued and continue, and I love the idea of making marks and see yourself grow. That's the most fascinating thing, and as far as kids go, uh, give yourself time to grow even though that may be very challenging at times because you may not have a reference into what is good and what is what is working. But you have to stay with it. Uh, there certainly was a need for me to stay with it because I had a presence. I was somebody. I became the class artist. And even though I struggled with uh, act my academics, I graduated from elementary school as a top male student. Why? Because I tried. I really wanted to contribute. So I continued. I continued with that. And, um, and, and, and there were certainly roadblocks. There were times when I was told that as a person of color, there was no opportunities for you. But I needed, I needed to make images. I needed that. And I also needed to make my mother, who supported me, uh, wholeheartedly, I wanted to make her proud. And so, um, but more than anything, it was that what Meg talked about, having that passion and that need. What I want to leave, I think, children with, and I want to speak directly to the children, is that the way I described my process and creating the little mermaid is, is in a way, uh, I want you to think about how you, your process and in, in whatever your dreams or passions are. And that is to see the value in the work itself, to see the value in, in, in the purpose itself. Why do I wanna speak? What do I wanna say? and stay there in that process and deem it as valuable. Meg? Oh man, this is beautiful. I'm, I'm, I'm soaking all of this in for myself. Like I, I'm asking myself these questions. I'm gonna be thinking about this all afternoon, Jerry, which is a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful thing to consider. So I'm going to um, talk about transformation in terms of middle grade children. So the Mercy novels, both um, both Changes Gears and Can't Dance, both of them happen in middle school. The first novel is Mercy Suarez in the sixth grade. The novel that came out this year, Mercy is in the seventh grade. And high alert, I just submitted the last, what will be the last Mercy book, Mercy in the eighth grade. And so when I think of kids in middle school, right, and everybody listening from middle school probably knows this, right? Man, a sixth grader is nothing like an eighth grader. Talk about butterflies, right? Going from one thing all the way to the other. Just physically, mentally, your friends, you are going to stretch like it's going to make silly putty look brittle. It's unbelievable how you will change. And some of those changes are going to be exciting and fabulous. Some of those changes are going to be hard and sad. That's the truth. 
And so when um, Mercy is sort of engaging in, in finding out how your friends change, how your feelings about your friends change, how we have to sort of forgive ourselves sometimes and forgive other people so that we can move on. And also just the inevitable changes that happen in families as people get older, as people get ill, et cetera. So, you know, I hope, you know, there are a lot of kids who face hard things every day. Um, but when you compound it, like when it's also happening, when you're doing all of this emotional changing yourself, right, in middle school, it can feel crushing. So what I hope a lot when kids read the Mercy stories is that they laugh at the funny parts, at the moments where they go, oh my gosh, I have somebody just like Edna Santos in my class, or um, oh no, don't make that decision, Mercy, you know, uh, you can't hide that. But like, I hope they laugh at the right part. And I hope also that they can feel connected to Mercy and ask themselves, well, what would they do in Mercy's shoes? What ought Mercy do? What would they do? Um, in other words, I want all of the kids to be thinking about um, how does this book sort of look like what's happening in my own classroom, in my own school, and in my own life? So that's what I most hope for the Mercy series, that it, it, for really for all my books, that it's like, I picture myself sort of walking through a cave with those really cool hats with the headlamp on, you know, and I can see just ahead of me, but I'm thinking of the kids like marching behind me and like, you can get through this cave, just follow the light, you can do it. So I guess my advice for kids, my parting advice for kids is read widely read things in pictures like Jerry Pinkney's incredible work, read novels, read science fiction, read historical fiction, read comic books, read graphic mm -hmm. novels, like fill, fill your mind with human beings' stories, all kinds, because it only, the only thing that will happen is that you'll get more tools for understanding yourself and other people. And that is a really good thing. Hello, my name is Andrea Lewis, and I work here at the Library of Congress. Wasn't that a great interview with Meg Medina about her new book, Mercy Suarez Can't Dance? Well, you know, there are many ways to dance, and the library's collection can help you explore the possibilities. It's amazing. For example, let's watch a clip from a dance battle performed here on the Coolidge Auditorium stage in the library's Thomas Jefferson Building. The dancers you will see are part of an organization called Urban Artistry. And if you get excited, don't hesitate to move. Round two. Juwan, let's get it. For more examples, search the library's website. Follow along, create your own, but most of all, have fun.